Welcome, welcome to the City Club of Portland, Oregon's premier citizens forum. We're delighted you're with us today. I'm Don Williams, president of City Club. Our program today is entitled, A World in Conflict, The World, The Way Out of Iraq. Our speaker is General Merrill Tony McPeak, former Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force. For the benefit of our radio and television audiences, please turn off your cell phones and other electronic devices. Next week's Friday Forum will be entitled, Why the Farm Bill Matters, From Oregon to Africa with Congressman Earl Blumenauer. He will address proposed changes in the Farm Bill and how they would affect Oregon. It's all about food at the City Club in September. In fact, we could call it the Fall Harvest. Programs will cover what we choose to eat, where our food comes from, and the implications of these choices, both for our families and our communities. In two weeks, Fall Harvest continues with a panel discussion entitled, Thinking Outside the Booth, Farmer's Market, the Public Market, and creating more local food choices. And if these two programs don't whet your, ap whet your appetite, there's more. On Monday, September 24th at City Club Commons, the Citizens Read Book Club will cover two books, Animal, Vegetable, and Miracle, and Plenty. And finally, on September 28th, City Club will host an open house with local food and wine at the City Club Commons. Now this open house is also a great chance to bid farewell to Wendy Rodmacher Willer, Willis, our executive director. She starts a new position at Oregon Solutions on October 1st. The final Friday is free and open to the public and for this event or any other event, please contact Kim at the City Club office for reservations. Speaking of Friday forums, Last week, we were privileged to have an excellent address by Dr. Robert Berdahl, who is president of the American Association of Universities. He spoke on privatization. If you could not attend it or didn't hear it on Oregon Public Broadcast, and you have a chance to hear a rebroadcast on C-SPAN radio on Sunday morning and next Tuesday evening. See the City Club website for details. We have one new City Club member today, and please join me in welcoming Vesta Kilkenny, who's retired. <laughs> We're fortunate to have terrific corporate sponsors for this program, and this quarter's sponsors are Stoll Rees LLP and Zimmer Gunsel Frasca Architects. Thank you for your support. Definitions. The war in Iraq has caused us to focus on definitions. For example, what is the difference between a surge and an escalation? Who do we consider to be a terrorist? Exactly how do we define success or even progress with the mission? The timing of General McPeak's appearance today could not be more fortuitous to City Club. General Petraeus and Ambassador Crocker both gave their reports to Congress earlier this week. Tuesday was the sixth anniversary of September 11th and renewed debate about the link between the attack and the original justification for going to war. And the nation viewed another tape of a defiant Osama bin Laden again. As concerned citizens, we struggle with many questions among the most important of which is, will the significant loss in lives and expense to fight the war ultimately be worth the benefits attained? In fact, predicting what will occur if and when the United States withdraws its troop is a challenge our nation's trying to address. The unknowns might lead some people to remember the now famous quote by former Secretary of Defense Donald Rumfeld about known and unknown unknowns. <laughs> Perhaps it's more appropriate, however, to quote one other of his statements about predictions. 
I would not say that the future is necessarily less predictable than the past. I think the past was not predictable when it started. <laughs> Fortunately, our speaker today is extremely well qualified to address the unknowns. And so we can have full disclosure, you should be aware of one more issue before I highlight our speaker's background. One of the hallmarks of the City Club is our effort to present wide-ranging debate on all sides of policy issues. As a result, we responded affirmatively when we received a, a request earlier this year to have a program on the war in Iraq by three generals. The program committee scheduled a specific date for their appearance, and you should know that approximately one month before they were scheduled to appear, they stopped re responding to City Club emails confirming the details of their appearance. City Club has been privileged to hear many speakers with Oregon roots who have gone on to distinguish themselves in national and international forums. General Tony McPeak is a great example. After attending Grants Pass High School, he went on to graduate with honors and distinction from San Diego State College and began his long and distinguished career in the military. It culminated with his appointment as Chief of Staff of the Air Force, which he served from 1990 to 1994. The General has appeared as a witness at more than 30 congressional hearings and he is also a regular commentator on both national and local television. A career fighter pilot, he spent two years with the Air Force elite aerobatic team, the Thunderbirds. General McPeak flew 269 combat missions in Vietnam and has mili military ratings as a command pilot and a parachutist. Among his military honors and decorations, are the Silver Star, two Legion of Merit Awards, and the Distinguished Flying Cross, which he also received twice. Following retirement from the active service, General McPeak began a second career in business. He's board chairman of Ethic Ethics Points, Inc., and he has served as the director of several public corporations, including Tektronix, TWA, and ECC International. You know, I was curious about how General McPeak would arrive today, since he currently flies a home-built, fully aerobatic aircraft, I thought he might ask for landing clearance at the Governor Hotel. <laughs> the McPeaks reside in Lake Oswego, and his wife, Ellie, who is here today, is on the City Council. They have two sons. Please join me in welcoming Merrill Tony McPeak. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Don. It's a pleasure to be here again. Last time I spoke to the City Club, I was still wearing a uniform. Well, I've talked in public about Iraq uh, perhaps a dozen times, and I guess I'm a failure as a motivational speaker. No one has ever left the place excited about our prospects. The reason is, from the beginning of this war, I've been unhappy, deeply uh, worried. So I walk around with this little rain cloud over my head, and I, I apologize about it. My disquiet does not spring from any uh, principled opposition to war. I spent 37 years in uniform, always either fighting somebody or getting ready to do that, and I loved nearly every minute. But to, to sum up a complicated set of ideas in the simplest way I can, I'm for war when it's undertaken for good reason and when the outcome can be expected to, to advance our national purposes. Otherwise, no. And I never thought this war in Iraq met either of these basic preconditions. Today, one usually hears the word Iraq spoken as part of a phrase, not by itself. Sort of like those born movies, the born identity, the born supremacy, except in Iraq, it's the Iraq failure, the Iraq fiasco, 
The one I hear most often is the Iraq disaster. Where is Matt Damon when we really need him? <laughs> Without going into detail, the decision to overturn Saddam's sectarian regime in favor of a Shiite-dominated government has handed a massive, massive gift to Iran, while at the same time creating a power vacuum, a humanitarian tragedy, and a recruiting, training, and money-raising bonanza for terrorists of every coloration. Not facing unpleasant facts has been one of our problems. But were we to do so, we'd notice we've already lost in Iraq. What we want, or what we do, or what we say, will no longer decide the matter. The chief purpose of the American Expeditionary Force is to leave as soon as possible, with as few casualties as possible. The exit strategy has become the mission. So, like Korea or Vietnam, the Iraq War is a defeat for us. But in Iraq, we didn't merely lose. We broke lock with reality so completely that the only convincing plea is temporary insanity. Now, there are military aspects to this disaster, and I'll say more about that in a bit. But make mo no mistake, this is mostly a political failure, the consequence of four factors. The presence in the policy mix of any one of these four factors would have been enough to cause great national harm. The four in combination produced a perfect storm of self-inflicted damage. So let's just name them. One, assessments of the situation that were bent through a prism of ideology. Two, confused and changing objectives. Three, misguided or non-existent planning. And four, a dismissive and arrogant leadership style. I think the influence of each of these factors must be so obvious to everyone uh, who isn't a recent arrival on this planet that I won't spend time proving the existence of each. There's a fine film in town, No End in Sight, which you should see if you want independent confirmation coming from the mouths of major participants. So our objective should be to let the Iraqis themselves sort out the mess we've made. We have every reason to think it will be an ugly process. So turning the problem over to them is not a good option. But there are no good options. And rather than reinforce failure, the United States should disengage with a complete, orderly, and phased withdrawal. Though the step-by-step -step process is complicated, the overall picture is pretty easy to visualize. On a small scale, the Brits are showing us how it is done in real time with their departure from the southern city of Basra. The withdrawal will be phased. First, the ground forces in outlying provinces will pull in to concentrate on main operating bases. We've created perhaps a dozen very large bases sprinkled around the country, and our forces outside Baghdad will gather at these in phase one. While this provincial withdrawal phase is underway, it may look as if things are going well. Uh, just now, for instance, there is a deceptive quiet in the West, in Anbar province, welcomed in recent assessments as showing we're making progress. What's happening there is we've armed formerly insurgent Sunni sheikhs, clan and tribal leaders, and they're whacking away at al-Qaeda insurgents, which is good. The problem is, as we withdraw, these same Sunni sheikhs will find they have a lot more in common with al-Qaeda than with the Shiites. So we've invested in the short term, sort of like burning the furniture in winter. 
Phase two of the withdrawal is the collapse of forces north, east, and west of the capital back into Baghdad itself and south along the highway to Kuwait and the Gulf Coast. It's 340 road miles from Baghdad to Kuwait City, and we must control that line of communication. The road goes through Basra, where, as I say, the Brits are in the process of decamping. Basra is Iraq's second largest city, and with the remnant of the British force camped outside of town already, and soon to be gone entirely, if anyone controls the place, it is a Shiite militia, the Mahdi army of Maqtada al-Sadr. That highlights another development on scene, also reported by the White House spin doctors as encouraging. After some very heavy fighting in Karbala with uniformed national police, loyal to a rival Shia faction, Muqtada al-Sadr announced a six-month suspension of Mahdi army operations. Like the situation in Anbar, this would be good news if it didn't look so much like a tactical move. We have to guess that Sadr has met his near-term objectives is in control where he needs to be and can afford to rest and refit for a final push that may come after we leave, which would be bad, or as we leave, which for us would be worse. Phase three then is the pullback into Kuwait. We don't know what the conditions will be. It could be a fighting withdrawal and it could get bloody. In either case, it will be a non-trivial problem getting through Basra. My guess is they'll let us go. The main reason being if they concentrate to attack, we'll respond with air power, our asymmetrical combat advantage. So it's more likely to be isolated small actions or roadside bombs that will be worrisome and impose some attrition, but will not constitute an existential threat to the withdrawal. If we are clever, and so far we've shown little evidence of this, but if we're clever, we'll manage the public aspect of the withdrawal in a way that allows the Iraqi government to take credit for it and so enhance its legitimacy. And perhaps the Iraqis will give us a break thinking they've embarrassed us enough for one war. The fig leaf we'll use to cover our nakedness on the way out is, in any case, made of cellophane. In brief, that's my view of what lies ahead. The only unanswered questions relate to the start date of the withdrawal and deciding whether to announce a timetable. Remember, the Brits, who have been making foreign policy blunders longer than we've been a country, are showing us how to do this. They're withdrawing in stages and making no announcement about a schedule. Now let's turn to lessons learned, first of all on the military side. The defeat has political roots, but it still counts as a military defeat. At the end of the day, our performance in battle did not provide enough thrust to overcome the political drag. What went wrong? As this mess has developed, our primary concern has been to support the troops. That's a proper concern. But it's also a slogan, not a strategy. It doesn't tell our troops how they're expected to act or what they're expected to accomplish. It's been especially hard in this war to hold our soldiers to high standards because of the corrupting influence of incompetence and recklessness at the policy level. If you take, for example, the matter of prisoner abuse at Abu Ghraib, it's hard for us to be criti critical of Lindy England posing for photos on the night shift when the White House itself is so contemptuous of the Geneva Conventions and other niceties of humane and lawful treatment. So we've tended to give the troops a pass. This has been especially true of the Democrats, on whom we have not been able to rely for effective opposition because they're so freaked out about looking like sissies. 
Regarding the performance of our military, lives are at stake, now and in the future. It's no place for political correctness. The best way to honor our troops and respect their service is to be critical, to figure out what went wrong and put it right. Support the troops. <laughs> Support the troops may be a domestic political imperative, but here in this forum, we can do better. Let's start with who does what. The function of the individual services is to organize, train, and equip forces that are provided to joint commanders for operational employment. So in the present case, the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps organize fighting units, equip and train them, then put them at the disposal of U.S. Central Command for use in Iraq. On both these levels, the level of the services and the level of uh, the Joint Operating Command, there are lessons to be learned. Most are detailed, highly professional, perhaps not of general interest, a lot of inside baseball. But let me summarize in broad brushstrokes a couple of problem areas looking only at the aspect of service contribution, that is, responsibility to organize, train, and equip our forces. Much has been made of the fact that our soldiers and Marines are poorly fitted out for some of the threats they face, the prime example of a threat being the improvised explosive device, or IED. In the beginning, personal protection, body armor, uh, was non-existent or cheaply made. The main vehicle used in ground fighting, the Humvee, was not well protected. We had no concept for how to detect and neutralize the IEDs. Administration politicians caught hell for this, the Secretary of Defense, even the President, and unfairly, I think. Hardware requirements are forecast, and equipment is procured by the services in programs that span years, even decades, certainly several administrations. When Secretary Rumsfeld sought to excuse some of his shortcomings, he said, famously, you fight with the army you have, not the one you wish you had. And he was right. I joined in the general criticism of Rumsfeld, but he was right in that case. We, the military professionals, missed the boat on equipping ourselves for the new set of threats we're facing and will face in the 21st century. We've lost lives and spent billions of dollars on crash programs to, equip, to uh, remedy equipment deficiencies and haven't really corrected them yet. Much the same criticism can be made concerning organization and training. It turns out the Army doesn't need long-range artillery or air defense missilery or tank divisions or doesn't need near as much of this sort of stuff as it has. The core roles of 20th century ground fighting were infantry, artillery, and armor operating together as a combined arms team. Though it's been obvious for some time that 21st century combat would be markedly different, the Army has clung to the old roles, resisting every call for change. We're going to continue to need infantry, though it has to be mounted and protected much better. But the activities that must be combined with infantry include such roles as close air support, special operations, psychological warfare, civil affairs, intelligence, medical support, and engineering. Too often, these are what we call orphan missions, not professionally rewarding, not a path to the top. And because they're so unattractive for career-minded officers, a lot of the manpower supporting these roles has been shuffled off into the reserve. I was still a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in 1994 when we invaded Haiti with a small force. Now you'd think a nation with a million and a half men under arms could invade that impoverished, defenseless island without calling up the reserves. But the Army then had nine Civil Affairs Battalions, people trained to run a country until its own government institutions can be revived. Of these nine Civil Affairs Battalions, eight were in the reserve component. So we had to mobilize to get our hands on these skills, had to do a presidential call-up to pull off a 10,000-man invasion. 
By the way, the army outfit that got us so much publicity at Abu Ghraib is a reserve brigade because all the army's POW brigades are in the reserve. This situation has to change. Our army is still organized, trained, and equipped for the big industrial wars of the last century when the job was to destroy the enemy. But in modern war, the idea is to modify enemy behavior, killing only as a last resort. And this is a much more difficult, subtler, more sophisticated task. So we've shown ourselves to be pretty good at blowing up Iraqi villages and neighborhoods and pretty inept at ending the insurgency. We need to bring back into the active force the skills needed to succeed in today's combat, satisfy and reward the officers and men serving in these career fields, then build on this to produce forces designed for 21st century war. Imagine how different Iraq might have been if we were properly organized, trained, and equipped for modern war. And before I leave this subject, one indicator of how badly we're set up for modern war is the presence in country of so many civilian contractors. The Pentagon has not been candid about the numbers, but it seems likely that at least 130,000 civilian contract personnel have been hired, almost as many people as we have there in uniform. In August, the U.S. Labor Department released figures showing more than 1,000 civilian contractors had been killed. Just over 400 deaths have been confirmed by DOD, which seems a rather large disparity. Most of these contractors are cooks and truck drivers in logistic and other support, but perhaps 25 or 30,000 of these contractors perform combat roles, or what we would call shooters. They're recruited from all over the world. 20 Fijians have been killed all of them shooters, reminding us of the proud warrior tradition of these South Sea Islands. Imagine the impact in Fiji, 20 strong men gone missing. By a wide margin, civilian contractors constitute the second largest army in the coalition. So when you hear that the surge increment, 30,000 men, can perhaps come home by next summer, Remember these 30,000 contract shooters. There's apparently no limit to the number DOD can hire. And the question we need to ask is, why are there any there at all? Our army may not be everything we'd like, but it's our army. You know, it inherits and embodies our traditions, our military heritage. We train it. We discipline it. It's subject to our military law, answerable to us. None of this is true of these civilian contractors. If our army isn't up to the job, let's fix our army, not hire gunslingers to carry the combat load. <clears throat> As I said, I'll not talk about shortcomings at the level of joint force employment, but one target is just too tempting. I expect you've all heard of General David Petraeus, but how many can name his boss, the four-star admiral whose central command headquarters is in Tampa, Florida? Admiral Bill Fallon, an excellent officer, cannot be happy about this situation. Because of the bureaucratic clout that Petraeus has picked up by providing top cover for the White House, Fallon is getting killed in the ancient game of office politics. There must be already lot, lots of infighting among and between headquarters staffs, corrosive in a chain of command. On this subject, there will surely be more to come. So the services, to some extent all of them, but again mainly the Army, have since the end of the Cold War continued to produce forces of the wrong design. Success in combat is hard, even if you get everything right. It must therefore come as no surprise that we're failing. And here, the political leadership, though ultimately accountable, 
can't really be blamed. Both the executive branch and Congress should be able to rely on people who spend their entire working lives in the profession of arms to tell politicians how combat units should be organized, trained, equipped, and used. We didn't fix ourselves after the Cold War or after Desert Storm because victory doesn't provide much incentive for change. Now perhaps defeat will be a stronger catalyst. As long as we look at our performance objectively and realistically and don't tell ourselves all we have to do is support the troops. As for what to fix politically, it's hard to know where to begin. Failure is so comprehensive, and I have time only to cite a couple of the many lessons learned. On the subject of foreign policy, I'm a follower of the school of realism, the hard-nosed and clear-eyed pursuit of our own interests. The world is a big place with lots of, distressed, lots of distressed people, all of whom have a claim on American attention if our aim is to end misery and impose good governance everywhere. Sometimes, perhaps even usually, we can do well while doing good. But first and foremost, we should do well. So let's start with the practical lessons about how to do the thing right rather than how to do the right thing. An old idea coming out of our experience in both world wars is that international security problems should be addressed in common. We found that when we do so, it serves our purposes because we can leverage our power more effectively when it is embedded in international institutions that enjoy broad legitimacy. Thus, we sought an international endorsement for each of our major armed interventions since World War II and got it in the case of Korea, Desert Storm, and Afghanistan. This wasn't true of our intervention in Vietnam, and Vietnam was our worst failure up until Iraq. Just to be emphatic, there's no idealism in an international approach to security problems. It's just a better, more effective way to work our own interests. But this common sense approach was abandoned by the Bush administration, which degraded diplomacy, turning it into a term of abuse. Our president told the UN Security Council they could either come along with us or be irrelevant. We tuned out our allies, dismissing them as the old Europe and renamed French fries. We sent an ambassador to the United Nations that even a Republican Senate could not confirm. We imagined that talking to adversaries or potential rivals was, by itself, doing them a favor. The lesson learned is hubris kills. The official count is approaching 3,800 dead, adding about 20 a week. Oregon has lost 63 so far, 18 from the Portland area, three from Corvallis, three from Newport, Read from Kalamath Falls. Hubris kills. We need to put an end once and for all to the presumption that we, acting alone, are best placed to decide for others what their national interests are. <clears throat> Hubris costs. The surge strategy has increased the burn rate to about $10 billion a month, $300 million a day, seven days a week. The population of my hometown, Grants Pass, has so far paid cash or charged nearly $18 million worth, is spending about $450 an hour, enough to put 50 minimum wage workers on the payroll or upgrade teacher pay or fix the bridges. Hubris costs. Hubris takes time. Let's be frank, we can always get more men. Babies are the product of unskilled labor. We can always print more money. People and money, that's easy. But the seconds and hours tick away, and they don't come back. People go over there and spend a year, 15 months, and they don't get it back. Then they go again. 
We spent four and a half years now on this war, using up time and brain cells that should have been put to work on bigger problems. We paid almost no attention to the Arab-Israeli dispute. Typically, the new Bush administration first ridiculed Clinton's efforts, then announced a policy of benign neglect, as if that could substitute for thought and hard work. Finally, Condoleezza Rice seems to be tossing up something, probably an air ball. <laughs> but we have no reason to believe we can ever put an end to the so-called war on terror or even manage it very well unless we get to work on the problem that is at its center. In 2002, Bush walked away from a deal negotiated by Clinton to stop North Korea's nuclear weapons program. The new administration first declared Pyongyang's nuclear program intolerable, threatened dire consequences, and refused to talk with the North Koreans until they ended their program. Bluster predictably failed, and we've finally done a turnabout, getting back to the same deal we could have had six years ago. Except in those six years, the North Koreans have become a nuclear power probably with half a dozen or so very dangerous bombs. Hubris takes time off the clock, and we don't get it back. We can only hope that the North Korean pattern, which I think is the most erratic and capricious foreign policy episode in our history, is not repeated with Iran. Another practical lesson is that while presentation is not policy, it matters how policy is presented. For instance, shortly after the attacks on us of 9-11, we announced the so-called Bush Doctrine, a policy of military preemption under which we do not wait to be attacked, but strike whenever and wherever we anticipate threatening developments. Of course, we've always had a policy of pre preemption. In fact, every country does. That's one of the definitions of sovereignty. Japan preempted us at Pearl Harbor. The Israelis did the same thing to the Arab states at the beginning of the Six-Day War. Certainly, many of our military engagements started with our attacking somebody. When we invaded the island of Grenada, for instance, it wasn't after they had previously come across the beaches in New Jersey. But because preemptive attack has such an unsavory reputation, remember December 7th, the day of infamy, most countries are smart enough not to announce such a policy. <laughs> In terms of presentation, it's obvious that a declaratory policy of preemption does more harm than good. So our friends abroad were, to say the least, puzzled by the Bush doctrine, and so should we have been. In the real world, it makes a difference if people think you're stupid. Now, I've talked for lessons in about lessons in political realism grounded in a no-nonsense view of the world, but we should turn a page and consider a couple of moral and ethical lessons which I regard as of increasing importance. The whole world watches what we do. CNN is everywhere. People know about our problems. They listen as we debate, and weigh, they weigh the ethical content of our proposed alternatives. Ethical strength is an element of soft power, but is getting more and more important in a wired world. So it's essential to do, so while it's essential to do the thing right, what about doing the right thing? Take the matter of Iraqi refugees. Perhaps two million Iraqis have left the country. Another two million or so are displaced inside the country, removed or fled from their neighborhoods as a result of the communal fighting. In absolute terms, it's more than the population of Oregon, all displaced, none because they want to be, and in proportion to our national population, it would be something like 30 million refugees. Among these refugees are thousands desperately seeking safety. Many worked with us or for us and are marked for execution upon our departure. Since, two, since the 2003 invasion through June of this year, we have allowed 466 Iraqi refugees to enter the, the U.S. In similar circumstances between 1975 and 1980, Presidents Ford and Carter took in more than half a million from Cambodia and Vietnam. In fact, if it were not for outside pressure, 
principally from Senator Ted Kennedy, who has made refugees uh, an issue for 40 years, the Bush administration would be ignoring this matter entirely. President Bush has yet to mention the topic in public. Again, let's consider prisoner abuse. The issue is not whether extraordinary means of interrogation are ever necessary. Grant that sometimes, in some scenarios, some people need to be leaned on. The issue is integrity. Other presidents have done dreadful things. Some of these actions have been upheld by history and some condemned. But Lincoln, Wilson, and Franklin Roosevelt had the courage to stand behind their decisions. They were not always right, but they were honest. Clearly, the current occupant is no, is no Lincoln or Roosevelt or even Wilson, but even he should be able to do better. President Bush reminds us of Autolycus in The Winter's Tale. Shakespeare says of him, he was sometimes honest by accident. <laughs> Finally, here is an ethical issue all Americans should think about. It comes under the heading of shared sacrifice. In an interview last January, President Bush was asked why he hadn't called for more Americans to sacrifice something. He said, well, you know, I think a lot of people are in this fight. I mean, they sacrifice peace of mind when they see the terrible images of violence on TV every night. A couple weeks ago, I had a hamburger down at Burgerville. They hand you this little thing when you, you, know, you could pick it up and eat. Down in the lower right-hand corner is an advertisement. Can you help? Families of the deployed Oregon National Guard could use your support while their family member is serving his or her country. If you'd like to help, and it says where to send a gift. It says what general, the guard. It's got the numbers here, contact information if President Bush would like to get involved. On December 15, 2004, 20 months after our invasion of Iraq, we watched as the nation's highest civilian award, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, was given to CIA Director George Tenet the former commander of Central Command, General Tommy Franks, and Coalition Provisional Authority Administrator Paul Bremer. Of course, George Tenet provided the intelligence estimate needed to drum up supports for the war, support for the war. Tommy Franks planned and executed the invasion, then sat on his hands while Baghdad and tens, maybe hundreds, of ammunition storage areas were looted, giving both initial impetus and sustainability to the insurgency. And Paul Bremer guaranteed a long fight by abolishing the Iraqi army and intelligence service, turning thousands of trained men loose in the streets without any money. Regarding these three men, this is by no means a comprehensive indictment, but it's enough. These three have much to answer for. Now, <clears throat> The reason you decorate people is so that others will follow the example they set. The ceremony honoring these three was, of course, at the White House, which is appropriate, although the building seemed that day somehow less white, maybe off-white, the grayish center of this dark chapter in American history. American dominance is not in danger. Sure, there are important shortcomings to fix, but for the foreseeable future, the world will have one global power and a number of regional ones. However, consider the collateral damage, if we use a term describing the undesirable side effects of battle action. We see the collateral damage everywhere. In less than a decade, we've managed to bankrupt our political and moral and ethical standing in the world. So while our invincibility in battle matters, and matters a lot, our ethical and moral decay may matter more. This is because in the long fight with terrorism, our best chance to prevail is in the arena of ideas. We should welcome a contest of ideas with a doctrine that at its core is negative, 
is against something that welcomes destruction, that finds happiness in violent death. Against this, we can hold up the American idea. It's a great positive idea. Our true asymmetrical advantage, a winner, if we give it a chance, if we remember it and live by it and act on it. It's the idea of liberal democracy, the rule of law, the protection of the weakest. It's the idea of freedom and progress of each generation living both a fuller and a richer life. It is in tarnishing this idea that we risk a fall from preeminence as a world power. Some days it seems we may already have passed the zenith or already coming down from the pinnacle of world power after what would have been a very short run as top dog. But decline is not inevitable. It's not written in stone. We have time to correct. We only need to remember the American idea and live by it and act on it. Thanks very much. Thank you, General McPeak. Asking questions is a privilege of City Club membership. A synonym for question is inquiry rather than statement. Please limit your question to 30 seconds or less and end it with a question mark instead of an exclamation point. If you violate this rule, you'll see this sign is a subtle reminder. Every person in this room has an opinion on a rock, but this period is for you to ask a question and let General McPeak respond with his opinion. Our first question today will be asked by City Club host, board host John Horvick. John is the project director of Parents and Children Together Study at OHSU. He graduated from the University of Minnesota in 2000 and moved to Portland and joined the City Club in 2004. John is currently co-chair of the club's new leaders council and has served on two City Club research committees. General McPeak, um, sitting here in Portland, I, I find Iraq a very confusing place, and I'm really reluctant to feel certain that any uh, plan put forward is going to be the correct one. So I'm going to ask you to play devil's advocate with yourself and outline what are the greatest risks of withdrawal if your plan were enacted, be they strategic, political, humanitarian, or whatever. Well, all those risks are there, and I think uh we're, we're, we're in for some hard times. There's a strategic risk because the Middle East is so important to us, strategically and economically. Uh, as we withdraw, uh, the Iranians will pick up greatly increased clout at the north end of the Persian Gulf. And uh, so strategic downsides are obvious. If we can stay in Kuwait for a while, maybe we can exercise some on-scene control there. There'll be a huge humanitarian disaster and we can only hope to help that. Some fires have to burn out. I mean, when I was young, Smokey the Bear said we had to put out every fire, right? Now if the Forest Service says, no, let's let some of them burn out, that's better. And uh, the fire uh, that is uh, sectarian conflict in Iraq may just have to burn itself out. Uh, but look, there aren't any, I wasn't listened to when I said don't do this. <laughs> so. So uh, I have no reason to think that uh, I'd be listened to today. Uh, but if I were, I would counsel that there, isn't, there aren't any good options. Everything we do has got a downside. And uh, cert certainly getting out uh, has to be done carefully, properly. As I say, don't announce a timetable, but it's the best option I see. General Steve Shell, member. Uh, Senator John Warner, ask General Petraeus a very specific question. Is America safer as a result of this war, paraphrased? 
My, my question to you is kind of a twofold one. First of all, was it appropriate for the senator to ask the general that question? And was it appropriate for the general to give the second response that he gave, which is, well, I haven't sat down and thought about that. So that's, that's the first, first part of the question. The other one is, is a broader one, which is, what's the role of generals, current and retired, in talking about political responsibility as opposed to military responsibility? Well, the role Petraeus is playing is troubles, troublesome, in my opinion. Uh, it has a very large political uh, content. And uh, I mean, it's, this is the president's strategy, but he constantly talks to it as if it were Petraeus' strategy, Petraeus' surge strategy, Petraeus' counterinsurgency approach. And uh, that gets it backwards as far as you know, our tradition of, of civilian control of the military in this country goes. So I'm troubled by the way Petraeus is handling his responsibilities. We'll just have to see how history uh, treats him, whether he ends up being Eisenhower or MacArthur, still a question mark. Uh, I don't like what he's doing, quite frankly. Uh, my view is when you're wearing a uniform, you salute and do what you're told. Uh, the, the, the man can ask you for military advice, how should I do this? And you go back and give him the options and say, if you want to do this, the quickest way, the fastest, uh, with the least casualties, here are your military options. That's the proper rule for a general. Once you take off that uniform, you're just like any other citizen. And uh, you can be as stupid as you want in politics. I've, I've been a, up there among the league leaders in that category, so uh, I uh, I regret my present involved, I'm presently involved in Barack Obama's campaign. I don't like it much. It takes a lot of time off the clock. Uh, but I'm so angry and upset about the way this uh, country's uh, st international standing has declined that I just couldn't sit on the sidelines. And I think when you're retired, you're paying tax, you're a citizen, you should get involved. Thank you. Paul Milius, club member, uh, Air Force veteran, thank you. Uh, I, my question runs along the same lines, but perhaps a little more pointed. General Shinseki and others uh, flatly told uh, the civilian leadership that they were going to need 400,000 troops to maintain the peace, not just one, uh, you know, win a nifty little war. Um, why didn't more of the senior officers in the military, the generals, speak out more loudly about the, the obvious weakness in that plan of sending too few to do too big a job. Was it their perks and pensions that they were protecting? Uh, was uh, they were looking forward to getting the sound of the guns in their promotion packets uh, so they'd get more medals and rank? Why, why was there not more pushback from the military about this? Well, <clears throat> look, when Shinseki made that statement about the occupation would require, require hundreds of thousands, it was in congressional testimony. Now, when you go over to appear in, one of, in front of one of these committees, they are quick to tell you that the JCS doesn't belong to any administration. They're there to give candid assessments. And that's what Shinseki did. If you really want to find out what one of the chiefs thinks, go read their congressional testimony. Inside the Pentagon, they're working for the president. And uh, like it or not, when you're working for the man, you try to figure out how to get what done, what he wants done. It's that got nothing to do with promotion or pensions or getting another ribbon, decoration. It's got to do with the man's the boss. That's how we define civilian control of the military. And so when he says, I'd like to invade Iraq, you say, you go part and say, okay, uh, when do you want to do that? You know, I always objected. I mean, when I was chief, Colin Powell was the chairman, and Colin Powell was a wonderful guy, close friend, but maybe the most political chairman of the JCS we've ever had. He's a guy who would argue, don't do this, doesn't make any sense. We had a big argument about this before the uh, intervention in Bosnia, the former Yugoslavia, with, with, uh, with uh, Powell scaring the 
trousers off of Clinton and, and getting him to stay out of there for too long. And so we had a lot of ethnic cleansing on the ground in, in Bosnia as a, as a consequence. So it's a balancing act. You have to decide what mistake you want to make when you're wearing a uniform. Do I want to be too political, too political or too apolitical? Your question leads me to believe you want generals who, are, who make the mistake in favor of being too political, pushing back against the civilian leadership. My mistake when I was wearing a uniform was to be too apolitical, not to push back, but to try to work the boss's problem. Susan Hammer, I'm City Club not member. I'm not uniform anymore, okay? So I'm, <laughs> I'm pushing back plenty. General McPeak, one of the most, I think, compelling uh, arguments for remaining in Iraq uh, is the anticipated bloodbath and the humanitarian problems that will follow and the other things that you mentioned. Can you do a comparison or a prediction of what those adverse consequences would be if uh, the United States started a phased withdrawal now versus doing it in, I don't know, three years, five years? Well, one thing that's happening on the ground is a lot of neighborhoods are being cleansed. And so there's less mixing right in front of our face. I mean, the, the communal strife is sorting itself out. We're building a big wall, you know, right through the middle of Baghdad right now to separate the sects. Uh, it's impossible for me to, under, to, to put a number on it. The president the other day did something that really kind of angered me, re comparing uh, what would happen when we leave with what happened when we left Vietnam. You know, a lot of boat people and evacuation off the embassy top and the uh, Khmer Rouge victory in Cambodia and so forth. For a guy, I was in Vietnam, you know. <laughs> so people who want to draw comparisons have to earn that, in my opinion. The year I was there, Here I was there, we were losing 250 guys a week, not, two, not 20. And uh, so the question is, how long did we want to stay in Vietnam in pursuit of policy objectives that were clearly flawed? I mean, how long do we want to stay in Iraq? You know, how, much, how long is it going to be before the situation improves? In my judgment, uh, the time to leave is now. Never be a better time. Uh, and what, after we go, there will be boat people and calamity and emergency evacuations and all the rest of it, and we'll just have to live through it. John Leeper, City Club member. Uh, General, I'm a retired soldier. I don't take exception to those criticisms that you offered regarding the Army. However, I think you let the other branches skate as if they were fault-free. And my question for you is, I find the administration is most ambivalent about the development of a logistic base for the Iraqi forces. And you didn't mention anything like that. We talk about these combat brigades and combat this and combat that for both U.S. as well as Iraqis. But we seem to have such mixed emotions about the development of anything in the way of a logistic base for the Iraqi forces. What's your perspective on that? Well, first of all, as I said, many of the criticisms that you'd have about our military engagement there are detailed and inside baseball kind of stuff. The other services have also been slow in adapting to modern war, with the exception of the Air Force. <laughs> but quite frankly, the Army's been the worst. The Marines have uh, been much quicker on their feet. They need a lot of changing too, but they've been much quicker on their feet. The Navy and the Air Force have really not had uh, a deep involvement, especially the Navy. The Air Force you know, got Zarqawi and uh, is, has been present on the scene, has done pretty well in the area of close air support. There have been no deficiencies, no notable deficiencies in Air Force performance. 
Uh, well, logistic support in Iraq. We've built a huge base infrastructure there. The Pentagon has not been candid about it, but we spent billions, we're still spending billions, building bases that have the look of a permanent presence is what we were after when we went in there. 10 or a dozen very large bases all over the country, billions of dollars worth of construction. The other aspect of logistic support has been the airlift of supplies and the, the boat lift of heavy stuff like ammunition, POL, and so forth. And uh, that's proceeded pretty well also. The big disadvantage is you've got that very narrow LOC running back to, the, to Kuwait. But I, basically, I don't have any criticism of the logistic support there, except for the fact that the services were slow and actually uh, requiring uh, the kind of equipment needed for this fight. I'm sorry we don't have time for another question. General McPeak, thank you for an excellent program. We're adjourned.